Stephen A. Cohen went from a small-time options trader to one of the most successful hedge fund managers of all time. Steve Cohen is the legend on Wall Street. He's amassed one of the great American fortunes. He founded SAC Capital and started generating some of the best returns out there. His track record, his performance were amazing and everybody wanted in. But how did the king of hedge funds do it? How does anybody make 60% a year? Well, the feds are asking that right now. Behind the multi-year federal investigation of insider trading at many Wall Street hedge funds. The deal looks phenomenal. There was a large network of insiders at a lot of these funds. And the trail that led from traders. The phone rings and says, Jeffries is going to upgrade Amazon in six minutes. 30 seconds later, I made about a half million dollars. To information brokers. They told me they were going to arrest everybody. To SAC Capital. Arrested fund manager. Doesn't matter who you are, rules are rules and the law is the law. Tonight on Frontline, to catch a trader. November 2010, a team of reporters at the Wall Street Journal was finishing a major story about a years-long government investigation into insider trading on Wall Street. That Friday, we had been just working so hard, getting ready to put the story out, and we knew that it was going to like really be a game changer. The article was published late that night. On New York's Upper East Side, a trader Donald Longio was alarmed that his former employer, hedge fund giant SAC Capital, was named. When Donald Longio read this article on a Friday night, uh, he panicked because it became very clear to him that they were homing in on him and some of his colleagues. Longio scrambled. He pulled apart several of his computer hard drives containing incriminating evidence and recounted what he did with the remains in a recorded conversation with his colleague, Noah Freeman. I put them into four separate little baggies, he told Freeman. And then I go on like a 20-block walk around the city and threw the in the back of like random garbage trucks. Both Don Longwheel and Noah Freeman had worked at SAC, and they both ended up um, pleading guilty after the government caught them on tape. Two former SAC portfolio managers were named yesterday. Prosecutors alleging what many have speculated for years, insider trading at Stevie Cohen's SAC Capital. The arrests were a big shock, but not a surprise to many traders on Wall Street. Listen, if you walked up to a typical Wall Street trader and would say, hey, is there insider trading at SAC Capital going on? After the guy falls on the floor dying of laughter, we'll get up and say yes. Okay, that's, He dies that's, of laughter because it's a naive question. It's a naive question. I mean, that's their reputation. The man at the top of SAC Capital, founder and CEO Stephen A. Cohen, has been the subject of numerous articles and reports. He is not speaking publicly on the issue of insider trading, and he declined Frontline's request for an interview. But in 2011, he was deposed for two days as part of a civil lawsuit brought against SAC. The deposition video was obtained by Frontline. The way I understand the rules on trading and inside information, it's very vague. Are you familiar with Rule 10b-5-1? Uh, no, um, no, uh, not that. You'd have to explain it to me. Rule 10b-5-1 is the Securities and Exchange Commission's principal regulation prohibiting insider trading. It states that no trades can be made on the basis of what is called material non-public information, proprietary information that can move a company's stock. Do you have an understanding about whether, when in possession of material non-public information, you're ever allowed to trade um, in security? Th you know, that's not the way it's explained to me. The way I understand the law is that it's very vague. So it's an interpretation okay. of the law. I think every hedge fund manager knows what material non-public information is. Um, and if they don't, um, I sure hope they're not managing your money or mine. So your understanding of the SEC rules on trading on inside information is that they do not preclude unequivocally 
trading while in possession of such information? I'm not aware of that. You don't know one way or the other? No. CBS News. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial is up 1.96 to close at 840.10. And gold. Stephen Cohen came to Wall Street after graduating from Wharton Business School in the late 1970s. Steve Cohen is the legend on Wall Street, and he's widely admired for the thing that people on Wall Street generally admire, which is making a tremendous amount of money trading. He's amassed one of the great American fortunes almost entirely on his own steam as a trader. Steve Cohn developed a reputation as having this sort of gifted ability to read the tape and to trade stocks. He was at a firm called Gruntle, which is kind of a middling brokerage firm on Wall Street. And the environment was very much Wild West, eat what you kill, you got to keep a large percentage of your profits, which wasn't really possible at a lot of other firms. And that was sort of his formative period. That's where he learned how to trade. If you talk to people on the street, they would say that's the type of place where you learn about insider trading in all its, all its capacity. Gruntle, as a firm, encountered a number of regulatory issues. There were people sanctioned for insider trading. There were a whole bunch of issues with the management of the firm. And it seemed like no one was even paying attention to what the traders were actually doing. By 1992, looking for a bigger stage to play on, Cohen left Gruntle with a small fortune and invested several million of it to start a hedge fund called SAC Capital. He would help pioneer a new kind of hedge fund. Hedge funds have been around for decades, since the 40s, but the 90s is when they really took hold because a lot of guys decided they did not want to put up with the bureaucracy and the politics of big investment banks. They thought they were smarter than everyone else and that they could make more money if they just went out on their own. It was another wild day on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average took off at the opening. It's important to remember that hedge funds weren't designed originally to outperform the market. While swings and stock prices have become almost an everyday event. They were meant to be this uncorrelated part of your portfolio. They were going to be hedged. So if a rich person wanted to protect some slice of their assets from sort of wild swings in the market, they could park some of their money in a hedge fund. They always existed. They were just much more sleepy before, I would say, 1998, 99, and that's when they started exploding. There were a number of funds that sort of had high-flying, big returns. So suddenly everyone thought, OK, you know, hedge funds have juice. They're going like, to beat the market. They're going to make me rich. And the expectations among investors changed, and people started to think, this is normal. But among the new breed of hedge funds, Cohen's returns stood apart. And so did his fees. He had an incredibly aggressive fee structure. The standard in the hedge fund industry is what's known as 2 and 20. That means you charge 2% of the assets you have under management and 20% of any profits. Cohen charged 3 and 50, meaning 3% of assets under management and 50% of any gains. And the reason he could get away with it is really, really simple. His track record, his performance were amazing, and everybody wanted in. In his first seven years of managing money, Cohen had only three losing months. The worst, a 2% decline. He consistently trumped the market by trading in and out of stocks quickly. Cohen's strategy was really based around what people like to call an information-driven hedge fund. So he was all about trading around, say, the quarter. Intel exceeded Wall Street's earnings consensus by three the cents a share. A loss in the second quarter with revenue. When a company announces its quarterly results, stocks will either go up or down based on that company's earnings. Up 52% from a year trading ago. up in pre-market. A new fall coming, a new iPad coming. That June quarter number was scary. And Cohen's strategy was to get as much information as possible to have an edge, to be able to you know, make money either on the upside or the downside, depending on how a company's earnings come out. People were throwing around this term edge a lot, which essentially means, you know, what's your information advantage in the market? What do you know that other people don't know? People were talking about this very openly without any shame. You're constantly trying to get edge. If you have edge, that means there's a reason that you know that no one else does, legal or illegal, to buy the stock. Attorney Duff worked at the Galleon Group a hedge fund made famous by its founder and CEO, Raj Rajaratnam. It's all about getting information. They call it trading stocks, but it's really trading information. Like, that's, that's what we were doing. It was 
So you were constantly trying to make contacts um, of people who could help you make more money. So I was expected to go out two, three nights a week. You know, the tabs always picked up. There was not a restaurant I couldn't go to, a club I couldn't go to, which is great for a guy in his late 20s in New York City. And, you know, the city was mine. It was just there for the taking, and, and, and I took. But the purpose was for me to develop relationships and get information. For traders like Duff and those at other funds like SAC, the more contacts, the better. You would have one guy who knew what was going to be on the cover of Barron's two days before it came out. And you'd have another guy who would be able to call you and say, hey, a billion dollars is coming into the market in two hours. And you might go visit a friend in, in the Cape and find out that his father is a doctor. And then all of a sudden, you're thinking maybe he knows something to do with this drug that's trying to get approved by the FDA. So I started to realize that almost every relationship that you have could be, you know, information that, that will help you formulate a trade. Hedge fund traders also exploited the fact that they were very popular with stockbrokers on Wall Street. The reason why Wall Street loves these guys so much is because they're trading every day. So the market activity they generate is immense. And as they're trading so much, they're giving the Wall Street firms commissions. As the Wall Street firms are getting commissions, guess what? They give the hedge funds their best information. And more importantly, they would get the information first. The more commission you pay, you know, the better service you're going to get. In the industry, it's known as a first call. You need that first call, and you're going to pay for it. If you're paying the street 30 to $50 million in commissions, you're going to get people's first call. Recognizing that, Cohen was willing to pay brokers big commissions. The rumor about Steve Cohen was always that he paid exorbitant commissions in order to be the biggest fee payer on Wall Street so that he could get advance word about upgrades and downgrades. And I've heard many, many stories of bankers saying to their traders, if Stevie calls, you drop everything, he is our best client. Banks, because you give them so much trading commissions, tell you about market information before the rest of the world. Now, that has been considered legal. How in the hell is that legal? You know, markets are based on rumors all the time. You know, where do you draw the line between me misappropriating, getting someone to tell me what Apple's earnings are, or my sources in the market are saying, Apple's going to knock it out of the park. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a market. People talk. But the bottom line is SAC because of its size and how much it trades, gets first dibs on that information. Over a 20-year lifespan, SAC Capital became a giant among hedge funds. And Cohen himself amassed incredible wealth, including a sprawling 35,000-square-foot mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, a $62 million beach house in the Hamptons, and multiple apartments in Manhattan, including this $115 million midtown duplex. Cohen also assembled one of the most valuable private modern art collections in the world, and he has given tens of millions to charity. In 2002, Cohen sent out Christmas cards where he posed as King Cohen. By 2008, his personal fortune reached $8 billion. Beating the stock market year after year, Cohen's returns, even with his first calls, seemed too good to be true. He takes 50% of the profits, and then he returns even after that, like 30, 40, 50, 60%. So in order for him to return to you a 50% profit, he has to make 100%. He has to double money. Yes, and it averaged for many years 30% after expenses. After expenses, to deliver 30% to his that's clients... His, yeah, that's over time, is huge. ...means he's making more than 60% on the money he's managing. Now you know how you go from $25 million to, to $9 billion. How does anybody make 60% a year? Well, the feds are asking that right now. The government's investigation of SAC Capital has taken a long and circuitous route Seven years ago, 
it began focusing on a New York City hedge fund, the Galleon Group, and its CEO, Raj Rajaratnam. Rajaratnam was another Wall Street legend. He reigned over a very successful but relaxed, clubby, and freewheeling office. He was very charismatic. He was very bubbly. And, you know, it was almost as if when he walked into the office, someone was dropping rose petals in front of him. And, you know, it was like the, the homecoming queen. And everyone loved him. But Turney Duff remembers getting a hint of what was really going on at Galleon one day while manning the phones in Rajaratnam's absence. I remember sitting there on the desk one day, and Raj Rajaratnam was out, and the phone rings, and I'm like, Galleon. And the guy's whispering or something, and, and I'm like, hello, Galleon. And he's like, is Raj there? I'm like, no. So he's like, mm. He's like, Jeffries is going to upgrade Amazon in six minutes. Click. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do? Because like, if I don't buy Amazon and the stock's upgraded and the stock goes up, they're going to find out. But if I do it, you know, isn't this illegal? What should I do? And so I sat there for five minutes sort of trying to, to make a decision, and, and I ultimately ended up buying 100,000 shares of Amazon. 30 seconds later, I made about a half million dollars. Um, and I remember sitting there saying, wow, I'm like, if I got this call every day, I'd be a great trader too. Okay, you know, I need my own Mr. Whisper. Duff left the Galleon Group in 2001. Five years later, a lawyer at investment bank UBS was poring over some trading records. I was in the litigation department at UBS, and as part of that function, I was the internal investigations coordinator. So when a matter came up that was suspicious, it would land on my desk. And what happened was this hedge fund was flagged by compliance. John Moon was alerted to a hedge fund, Sedna Capital, suspected of violating rules regarding what's known as friends and family money. There were two parts of this hedge fund, a fund that had the public investor's money, and there was the fund that had the so-called friends and family money. And it appeared as though this hedge fund was allocating trades in a way that the friends and family would get all the winning trades and the public money would get the losers. And I started to look into some of those trades, and it also appeared to me that the timing of at least one of those trades was more than fantastic. So it was determined that I should go down to the SEC and report the matter. But it was the identity of Sedna's owner that piqued the interest of regulators. Sedna was run by Rengan Rajaratnam. And I said to them, by the way, um, you know, Rengan Rajaratnam is the brother of Raj Rajaratnam, who runs Galleon. And that got their attention. The Securities and Exchange Commission suspected that Rengan was getting insider tips from his brother Raj. Investigators requested Raj Rajaratnam's records, and in his instant messages, found recent communications between him and a woman named Rumi Khan, a well-connected Silicon Valley executive who once worked at Intel Corporation. Khan was someone familiar to the FBI. This person was what's called known to the Bureau. This person had been involved in insider trading in the past, and they were punished. No sooner than they came off probation, this person was engaged and involved in insider trading. So the SEC had their eyes on this person. Right. They had committed insider trading, been right. caught, been sanctioned, and then were back on the street. Right. And so... So now the question is, how are we going to approach this person? To get Khan to cooperate, an FBI agent, B.J. Kang, was sent to Atherton, California, to confront her at home. We try to initially do most of the talking. We, we tell them, we're, we're not just here to tell you that you're in trouble. I want to help you. Make it clear to that person that, you know, this isn't going to go away. Kang told her what the FBI knew, that she had passed valuable inside information to Rajaratnam. The message that we want to get across is, this is a serious situation. You know, if your life is never going to be the same again, after a two-hour meeting, Rumi Khan agreed to cooperate and become an informant for the FBI. In New York, agents had been looking for other potential informants among Rajaratnam's employees. We spent months surveilling people from their home to the subway to work. 
followed them on their breaks, listened to what they had to say, who they were speaking to, so that we could learn as much as we could about these people. One of those people was David Slane, a trader who once worked alongside Turney Duff at Galleon. David Slane was one of the most feared people on Wall Street. And he's, he's a big guy, very intimidating, and there wasn't a personality bigger on Wall Street when it came to trading. In June 2007, FBI agent David Shavs and his squad moved in. And on the given day, when we felt that the timing was right, we would get behind that person in a Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. And when the clerk would ask, how do you take your coffee? We would answer for him, two sugars and cream. Please come with us. We'd like to speak to you. And what was his reaction at that moment? Stunned. Slane was stunned and flipped. He soon provided critical insights into Raj Rajaratnam's inner circle. He had an amazing Rolodex. He had a lot of connections, and a lot of it, turns out, came from people he went to Wharton Business School with. So the people he went to Wharton with, some of them became executives in big companies and consulting companies, and he was still friends with a guy who worked at Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. So he continued to sort of cultivate these people. Some of them he actually had real friendships with. The FBI continued to gather more names. And when agents Carol and Shavs sat down at FBI headquarters to compare notes, they realized there was more corruption out there than they had suspected. As the Galleon case expanded, we realized that they had a large network of, of insiders and, and other funds that were willing to engage with them. How large? Significant. It was we're talking uh, 10 funds, 20 funds? It was a lot of funds. It was a, it was a lot of funds. What did you say amongst yourselves? What did you think you were onto here? We, we likened it to the first Jaws movie, that we're going to need a bigger boat. This was a bigger shark than you bargained for. It sure was. Sure was. Beginning in late 2007, the FBI obtained authorization to tap the phones of Galleon traders, including Raj Rajaratnam. Hey, Raja. Hi, Adam. How are you? Uh, a bit better. Um, listen, uh, I talked to Kamal last night. It was the first time federal agents had used a wiretap for an insider trading investigation. The deal looks phenomenal, too. In the past, they did it for mafia guys. They did it for drug dealers, obviously terrorism. But since the, the Wiretap Act was passed in the late 60s, that was basically it. Now we've got them going after white-collar criminals with wiretaps. Said nine, book value's 18. They approached it as if they were going after the mob. Okay, how's the market treating you today? Uh, like a baby treats a diaper. <laughs> One of the riches of wire intercepts is the freedom that they, they used in, in talking about uh, trading. And uh, this cascading flow of riches is still being uh, sorted through today. But remember, when guys are talking about stocks all day long, um, it's not easy to decipher what may be inside information, if you will. So my personal submission is we've probably missed a lot more than we captured. Hello? Hey, good morning, Raj. Hey, good morning, Joe. How are you? Hey, good. Now, positions are the same, so I just want to uh, find out what you guys are thinking. Don't have any number from last week. I just wanted to know whether you got any update on Synaptics because it's a large position for us. About $4 million of uh, cancellation on Notebook. Roger Rotten sources range from everyone from, you know, lower level company employees to fellow Wall Street traders. There was this dynamic character named Danielle Chiesi, who is a hedge fund manager who considered herself a seductress. Danielle? Hey, Raj. Hey, baby. How are you? I'm peachy. She had an affair with an IBM executive, and he was giving her inside information about the computer company. I'm a chick in this business with a reputation of knowing IBM. But the most shocking figure in the entire insider investigation was Rajat Gupta. Rajat Gupta was one of the most respected businessmen on the street, a board member of Procter & Gamble, American Airlines, and Goldman Sachs. Gupta was sitting on a call 
in October of 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis, hearing how Goldman Sachs was going to get a $5 billion investment from Warren Buffett, arguably the most famous investor in the world. And here was Rajat Gupta, had that information secretly, and what does he do when the phone call ends? He hangs up the phone, he calls his friend, the hedge fund manager, Raj Rajaratnam, and says, you're not gonna believe what's happening. Buffett's getting an investment into Goldman Sachs. So what does Rajaratnam do? He loads up on Goldman Sachs stock, and when they announce it that evening, he's able to make a lot of money. Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is now saying it is buying a $5 billion stake in Goldman. $5 billion of preferred is stock. After hours. It is already this is a huge surprise. Warren Buffett is buying a stake in Goldman. The next day, Raj gets on the phone with one of his traders in Asia, and he's so proud of himself. Hey, Ian. Hey, buddy. How are you? So, big drama yesterday, but yeah. I got a call at 358, right? Yeah. Saying something good might happen to Goldman. Prosecutors allege that Gupta had a financial interest in passing Rajaratnam insider tips. He was convicted on insider trading charges, but is now appealing. Rajaratnam was convicted and is serving an 11 year sentence. There's a picture I've seen of you with Rajaratnam under arrest. Put me in the moment. There are two sides to that where this was a culmination of the amount of work that we put into it. Um, and, but the other side, the bigger side for me was that based in part because of the Galleon investigation, we still had a tremendous amount of work to do. So it wasn't, we made the arrest, now it's over. It was, we made the arrest, okay, now we continue. The FBI refocused their investigation. Informants had pointed them toward independent research firms known in the industry as expert networks. Well, a number of traders have said to me that everyone in the business used expert networks, that basically you weren't doing your job if you did not talk to expert network consultants. Please enter your conference code now. There are about 40 expert networks operating nationwide. I think it's pretty volatile. Uh, Independent of the traders and with almost no regulation, they can act as matchmakers putting employees inside companies on the phone with big investors like hedge fund portfolio managers. That sounds good. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. Now, there were rules, and even the expert networks knew that there were rules as to what the public company employees could and could not speak to money managers about. So you might be able to give a broad view on, say, a product that your company might be developing, but you can't tell the portfolio manager, you know, what the upcoming quarter is going to be. And, of course, these Wall Street money managers, they wanted as much information as they could possibly pump out of these public company employees. So you had a lot of hedge fund guys calling up middle managers at manufacturing equipment firms, asking them about their orders or their pipelines or how many trucks are in your parking lot. They had uh, portfolio managers talking to doctors, researchers at drug companies to explain about the development of a particularly hot new drug. Then you had the hedge fund investors paying a lot of money to these expert network firms who would then pay these consultants. For notebooks, it's basically about 65. Expert network firms charge as much as $5,000 for an hour-long phone call. Large unforecasted order that might... Some hedge fund clients paid as much as a million dollars a year. With that kind of money in play, expert networks were under pressure to deliver actionable information. Expert networks were the sort of middleman that misappropriated the information directly from the company to the, uh, to the, to the hedge fund trader. The tr hedge fund trader is paying a lot of money. You know, they, they want to know more than theoretical and sort of uh, you know, intuition. They want to know what could move a stock. They don't want just punditry, they want hard facts and they want inside information. That's what it leads to. It led to that in many, many cases. Expert networks performed a very legitimate function in the industry. They were also used for insider trading. And we learned this because uh, we used cooperators uh, to join these networks, and we recorded these telephone calls. 
This is James. Uh, James, good morning. This is Carl. Oh, hi, Carl. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. In 2009, the FBI had an informant pose as a hedge fund manager and call an expert network in Mountain View, California. Primary global uh, research. Walk me through how it works. So, do you uh, give me a list of contacts? You will get information from our website. The informant is speaking to a PGR vice president, James Fleischman, who explains how the service works. And then we'll set up the call for you. We just try to provide anonymity to some degree for the for the experts. That's just to protect them. Yeah, you know, we have people from a lot of public companies. Fleischman also explains how to hook up with one of PGR's better experts. Generally, what you want to see with these experts is that, you know, people talk to them and then they check back with them, you know, a, a couple months later. So, there, you know, there's a pattern that, that she's, you know, providing information that, that's useful. And I see a little bit of that. <laughs> In an interview with Frontline, Fleischman described how PGR tried to protect itself individual consultants that you were linking up with the hedge fund managers were asked to sign an agreement by your company. Right. And that agreement stipulated what exactly? So it stipulated that they couldn't talk specifically about their own company. They couldn't give out proprietary information about their own company. And why was that agreement um, important? Well, because, because there's security laws, uh, you know, that, that prohibit that type of information being exchanged. But in a manuscript Fleischman shared with Frontline, he admits this kind of exchange was inevitable. You wrote that it, it occurred to me, this is your writing mm -hmm. in, a, in an unpublished memoir, uh, it occurred to me that over the course of these calls that experts may at times have been talking about things they should not have been. Hmm. It occurred to me, well, I was aware of the fact that it was possible that, that they could be disclosing information that they shouldn't have been. But there were, no, there were no specific instances that I was aware of. But, but you did say, I mean, not only that it was possible, you say, you wrote, uh, it was bound to happen from time to time. So you were aware that this was not just possible, but was likely. No, I wouldn't say that. Well, you said it was bound to happen. I'm quoting you, okay. right? Given the volume of calls and the nature of the investment community's thirst for information, it was bound to happen. OK. Yeah, if you have 10,000 calls, you know, is there going to be, is, is a consultant going to give out a piece of information um, that they shouldn't? You know, is that going to happen? The probability is, yes, it will, it will happen, that someone will talk about something that, that, that they, they shouldn't if you, if you have 10,000 calls. Fleischman insists he did nothing wrong. But the FBI didn't only record Fleischman. Agents also had a wiretap on PGR's private conference line. Hello? Hey, Willie. How are you? The woman speaking is Winnie Zhao, a Taiwanese-born Stanford graduate. Zhao was a Silicon Valley contractor who made more than $200,000 as a PGR expert consultant. Winnie Zhao was one of these consultants very well connected inside the technology world, especially at um, companies that had operations in Asia. So what have you been hearing from your friends? Um, well, the, the orders down. For who? I broke out my veil at all kinds of orders. NVIDIA as well. She had worked at NVIDIA, so she had friends there. So um, she maintained the friendship. So Qualcomm's okay, but everyone else is cutting orders? Yeah. And how, I mean, how are you guys? Zhao was consulting for an SAC trader named Noah Freeman. Any other updates? How is Q4 looking? Q4 uh, utilization probably dropped to low 80. Freeman shared Winnie's tips with his colleague, Donald Longio. And these hedge fund guys are making a ton of money off Winnie. She was someone that, you know, would demand payment. 
You know, she was kind of a, described as a high maintenance person. She would message them and she'd say, uh, you, are you guys going to pay? I'd say, yeah, sure, we're putting the checks in. And then she would say, oh, no, cooks need more sugar. I'm going to need more sugar than this. And Noah told his secretary at one point to get a $500 gift certificate for a nice women's clothing store and to send it to her as a, a thank you. And so they send her the, the, the uh, gift certificate and it gets sent back returned. Don't want it. What do you want? Um, she wants um, $500 gift certificates to the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> and then uh, she wanted live lobsters. I think what's interesting is how many hoops people go to to get the information. I mean, you would think some guy from SAC Capital would say, you want a lobster? You know, f off. You know what I'm saying? But no, <laughs> she got the lobsters because she was giving him what he needed, which was inside information. So, for Q, well, for my bill, revenue is 842 Yep. Freeman says that over a four-year period, he made five to ten million dollars by trading off of Winnie Zhao's information. That's all I have. Okay, that's very helpful, Winnie. By May 2010, the FBI was ready to move in. I stopped to get some lunch at a Subway sandwich shop. I walk in and there's a couple guys in suits, and these two guys turn out to be FBI agents. They played recordings for me. And they told you what? They told me they were going to arrest our clients. They were going to arrest. Our consultants, they're going to arrest everybody. Fleischman served 14 months in federal prison. Winnie Zhao was sentenced to four years based on Noah Freeman's profits. Freeman, on the other hand, began cooperating with the FBI and has not been sentenced yet. In November 2010, the Wall Street Journal broke the PGR story sending Donald Longiel on his frantic early morning effort to destroy evidence. Three days later, the FBI raided two other PGR clients. The raids come on the heels of a weekend report in the Wall Street Both Journal. had close ties to SAC Capital. In fact, capital management and level global investment. News that the U.S. attorney in Manhattan arrested members of the expert network firm Primary Global Research, and we wondered when federal prosecutors would get around to charging hedge fund managers. Informant Noah Freeman had led the FBI to his good friend and former best man, Donald Longiel. He also spoke openly about life as a trader at SAC. He gives a laser sharp view of what life is like at SAC. Um, he tells the FBI that to do business and succeed at SAC, it was understood that you give material non-public information. The way SAC works is that these traders operate in pods and they're very independent. There's not a lot of oversight. And if Cohen likes one of your ideas and puts it in his portfolio, then you get a percentage of his profits as well. So if you were a cynic, you would say the incentive for people at SAC is to do whatever they can to make money. And Cohen doesn't have to know about it. He can be insulated from the source of people's ideas. But in March 2013, another arrest. Michael Steinberg, an SAC portfolio manager very close to Stephen Cohen. Steinberg's been at SAC for 10 years, you know, trading mostly tech stocks, and is considered a very, very uh, trusted confidant and source of information to Cohen. He rose through the ranks. He was, he was a trusted sort of arbiter. You know, Cohen would go to him to kind of make sense of varying opinions about stocks. Investigators believed that through Steinberg, they had caught Cohen selling an $11 million stake in Dell Computer based on illegal inside information. The government says that Cohen received an email that said, I have a source inside Dell that's giving me information that the quarter is going to be bad. What Cohen's lawyers have said is that he did not read that email before he sold Dell stock. He was out at his beach house in the Hamptons that day when the email came across his screen, and he just didn't read it. Cohen's lawyers say that he sold his Dell shares because another SAC trader he relied on was also doing so. No charges were brought against Cohen. Steinberg pled not guilty to insider trading and was convicted in December 2013. He currently awaits sentencing. But now, there's another case focusing attention on Cohen and SAC Capital. Did you ever see Mr. Cohen? 
SAC portfolio manager Matthew Martoma is accused of using an expert network to obtain valuable inside information. Through an expert network, Martoma cultivated a doctor who was involved in the clinical development of a, a very important drug for Alzheimer's that was being developed by two companies, Elan and Wyeth. Wyeth is writing up its latest prescription for investors. We actually have six projects now in Alzheimer's disease, two of which are in clinical trials. We collaborate with Elan on those. and You're collaborating with company. Elan right. uh, on those. So to help with the drug testing, Elon and Wyeth had hired a University of Michigan neurologist named Sidney Gilman. And through an expert network, Martoma had developed a relationship with Gilman, who was giving him all sorts of information. Elon Corp, up $2.09. The company and its partner, Wyeth, have started advanced trials for their Alzheimer's disease treatment. Initially, the news looked good. The trial's promising. Wyeth moved up $2.03 to $58.41. There's great optimism about the success of the drug. And over the course of 2008, SAC built up a huge position that was really, really bullish on Elon and Wyeth. And inside SAC, there was, a, there was a thought that it was just too risky to be exposed to those two companies heading into the trial announcements. There were several analysts and traders who felt very bearish on Elon and Wyeth. And they could not understand why Martoma and Cohen were building up these pretty substantial unhedged positions. And uh, Cohen would say, well, Martoma knows a lot about this. Martoma. Uh told Cohen that he had the greatest conviction in the stock, and Cohen said, he's my guy, and they stayed long the stock. In Santa Rosa, California, a pharmacist and private investor, Greg Kappas, thought the news looked good, too. He had purchased more than $1.2 million worth of Elan shares. So they had a first trial on a drug, and that looked promising to you, and that contributed to your decision to buy more shares. Yeah, I thought that that was, was really, what was really going to drive this stock to levels that would make me and several other people happy. And what did that mean to you when you uh, learned that SAC had taken a large position? I thought that that was a good sign. To see them pumping money into it, you'd think to yourself, wow, I got ahead of the curve here. Um, I'm with the big boys now, so this looked like a good thing. But unbeknownst to Kappas, nearly two weeks before the drug's second round trial results were released to the public, the government claims Dr. Gilman leaked the results to Martoma. In the days before the results of the clinical trial are due, Martoma allegedly gets a PowerPoint from Dr. Sidney Gilman revealing some really bad news about these drugs. And Martoma calls up Steve Cohen, and the only people in the world who know what happened on that conversation are Martoma and Steve Cohen. The next day, SAC started to ag aggressively unwind its large positions in Elon and Wyeth, and in fact ended up going short those two stocks to make a bet against them. Elon PLC tumbling $14.12, that's a 42% drop. The announcement came out, the results were very Elon negative, and both Elon and Wyeth dropped in value. So according to the government, SAC ends up making an estimated $275 million based on inside information. Dr. Gilman is cooperating against Martoma in what has become the largest insider trading case in history. Greg Kappas lost more than a half million dollars and has joined a class action lawsuit against SAC. So you played in the market and you lost? Yes. It happens to people all the time in the stock market? Yes. What was different? It was gamed. Um, and in hindsight, what we found out is that SAC um, knew the hand before everybody else did and acted accordingly. This is a copy of SAC's Code of Ethics and Conduct obtained by Frontline. In the industry, it's called a compliance manual. It spells out the rules prohibiting insider trading. In his 2011 deposition, Cohen was asked by the plaintiff's attorney if he was familiar with SAC's compliance manual. Now, the SAC compliance manual at the time provided that if you were in possession of material non-public information, you could not trade, period, correct? Yeah. Well, the way I select objective uh, reform... Actually, I, I don't know what it says. Okay, so you don't know at the time, you didn't know what SAC's compliance manual said on insider trading? In, uh, uh, when it comes to trading, I, I rely on counsel. 
You know, you're talking about somebody who's been in the industry for 30 years. And for him to be that oblivious of these very central things to his business in that deposition was shocking. I don't remember what it says. Okay, so you don't know today, sitting here as the head of the firm, what your right. compliance manual says. I, I, I've read it, but I don't, if you're asking me what it says today, I don't remember. What it meant was he really didn't care to have an understanding of what the rules were or even what was in his compliance manual, which just told me he didn't take those things very seriously. And there was trading in Fairfax. In the deposition was part of a lawsuit filed against uh, SAC and uh, other hedge SAC funds by a company called Fairfax Financial Fairfax over allegations of price manipulation. And we went short Fairfax. Fairfax had been targeted for what's classically called a bear raid, which is when short sellers go out into the marketplace and try and drive the stock price down artificially by putting out negative information about the company. Well, it really comes down to where they heard that. And if they heard a rumor, I think it'd be totally appropriate. If Michael Bowie asked Cohen whether he thought it was acceptable for his traders to short a stock if they have advanced knowledge of negative press stories about the company. What if they sent you an email that said the reporter told me is coming out with a negative story? Is it your testimony it would be okay for them to short? If the story was not coming out in a relatively short period of time, I would say uh, there was ambiguity on that. I think it might be okay. Fairfax's suit was dismissed, but the Securities and Exchange Commission took an interest in Cohen's answers under oath and subpoenaed his deposition. A deposition by Steve Cohen may come back to haunt him as he tries to protect his SAC capital from a federal insider trading lawsuit. In July of 2013, the SEC brought a civil case against Cohen, alleging he failed to supervise his traders, a charge he is fighting. They basically said, look, this was an operation where there was a complete failure of compliance, and Cohen, who has his name on the door and owned 100% of the firm, failed to properly supervise these guys. That same month, the Justice Department filed a criminal indictment against SAC, calling it a magnet for market cheaters. The government decided that they found insider trading so pervasive that they wanted to put their foot down and say, OK, this is effectively a criminal enterprise, and we're going to declare it that and charge the firm criminally. Stephen Cohen's lawyers have argued that he has never been involved in insider trading. Cohen has repeatedly declined Frontline's request for an interview. The embattled hedge fund is preparing to give back most of the client money it still manages. But one client is staying put. He is Ed Butowski, the managing director at Chapwood Investments. But one Dallas money manager, Ed Butowski, did agree to talk. Allegations have been made. But, you know, what, what kind of country do we live in when everyone in the world just starts convicting somebody when we've yet to hear back from Stevie Cohen? It's unusual for a money manager to come public like this and speak out on behalf of a fund like SAC. I'm not so much speaking out for the firm. I'm speaking out for due process. And I don't know all the facts. All I know is what has been alleged. And if some it's people- It's not here, just allegations. Right now, it is allegations. Has C.V. Cohen or SAC been put on trial and have they been convicted? Individuals have pled guilty to insider trading Okay, give me facts. Tell me exactly what it was, what did it amount to, and did Stevie Cohen know it? Did the firm know it? Because guess what? It happens. There are bad people out there. In November 2013, after months of talks... Right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Preet Bharara, and I am the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District... SAC Capital uh, agreed to plead guilty as a corporation. For engaging in insider trading that was substantial, pervasive, and on a scale without precedent. Under the proposed agreement with prosecutors, SAC would cease to operate as a hedge fund. And as sole owner, Stephen Cohen would pay the largest insider trading fine in history. In the record amount of $1.8 billion. And U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara says the insider trading investigations will continue. A number of people have been charged and convicted, and the investigation remains ongoing. It doesn't matter you know, who you are, how much money you have, who you're connected to, 
you have to play by the same rules as everyone else. You know, rules are rules, and the law is the law. Cohen has not been charged with insider trading. The judge who sentenced Raj Rajaratnam questions if there is enough evidence. The government uh, alleged that SAC Capital was, quote, a veritable magnet of market cheaters. And they then decided to indict the company, not the founder and architect and president, the man who ran the company. Does that make sense? Well, you have to assume by looking at the indictment that the government did not believe it had the goods uh, on Mr. Cohen. So if I form a company and, you know, I have a thousand employees, but I have a couple of units of that company that are engaged in criminal behavior, um, even if the company is indicted, I don't really face any consequences for setting that up. In the criminal law, in order to be guilty and for the government to be able to convict you, you have to show criminal intent a willing intent to violate the criminal laws. But there is such a thing as criminal negligence. Well, yes, there is such a thing as criminal negligence. You can't violate the insider trading laws. You can't commit fraud negligently. As it stands, the criminal negligence laws that cover some industries do not apply to finance. To change that, Congress would need to pass a new statute we have conspiracy statutes, and we have aiding and abetting statutes, and we have uh, the, the, the criminal ability to, to bring a case against an institution. But we don't bring criminal cases against people for negligence. Do you think you'll ever see a case where negligence um, rises to criminal liability? I, I, you know, I, in, I, the, I, in, the, in, the, in the in the hedge fund I, world? I, don't, I, I, I would doubt that. The trial of SAC portfolio manager Matthew Martoma, who pled not guilty, starts this week. The Justice Department is actively investigating two other insider trading cases involving SAC.